Well, I remember my time in seminary. Uh, I should remember it. Uh, I was there for nine years. It's a four-year degree. I only took nine to complete it, so I got my money's worth. Uh, I, I, I spread it out over a whole decade. I think I've told you all before, the grad student who taught my first class was the president who handed me my diploma. So I was great for Dr. Bailey's career. I, I, I helped him go all the way from grad student to president. And um, as I reached the end of my nine-year trek through seminary, I, I was just trying to get it done. I was just trying to check off classes, had a few I needed to get. And it was, it was probably the second semester before I was to finish, I saw that a class I needed, kind of an upper-level class in, in the area I was focusing in, was being taught by a professor I'd never taken, but I'd always wanted to study under. He's one of the more famous professors at seminary, and I always wanted to take his class. So I signed up for his class, and I was excited to go. I remember the first day I walk into class, and as I'm walking in the door, I'm a few minutes early, as I'm walking in the door, the professor's at the door, and he says, you must be Mike Shear. And I thought, wow, I don't, I don't know if you know me because of who I am, or if you know me because you're just a great professor and you've somehow researched all your students, but you know my name. And uh, I thought that was amazing for about the next 30 seconds till I walked in the class and saw the context. He was not coming to greet me. He was coming to shut the door. Even though I was early, I was the last one there. And I, I sat in a room. All the desks were pushed aside, and there was just six of us. There was the professor and then five students sitting in a circle. And as we uh, went around the class, I realized the other four students were all teaching assistants to this professor. They, they were all his graders, and he knew me because he didn't know me. He knew me because he knew those guys well, and I was the name he didn't know. And uh, so, so he knew me, and as we talked, I realized I'm not, uh, not only am I the only one that's not a teaching assistant, I'm also the only one that's not going on to pursue a PhD next year. These guys were all uh, enrolled in PhD studies. And it, it was the first moment in that class where I thought, I don't know that I really belong here. <laughs> you know, I, I'm nine years into seminary and these guys are going on to do a PhD and grading people's homework. Th this, isn't, this isn't my group of people. Well, as the semester went on, he would, uh, every day we'd come into class, we were studying First and Second Thessalonians, we're studying it in the Greek, and so we'd come in, and I always sat the third person to his left, and he was a creature of habit, so we'd come in, and he would always turn to the person on his left, and he said, well, let's start with you, just translate the next verse, whatever verse we're on, and translate that from the Greek with only the Greek text open on your desk, and, and he would translate it flawlessly, you know, and he go the next. So I got in the habit, I was always three over, so I'd always go, I know we're on this verse, so I'd go one, two, three, and I'd memorize that verse in English the night before. And I'd count around, four, five, six, seven, eight, I'd memorize that verse every night. So then, you know, I could take my Greek text, and you know, I've got it memorized in English, but I'm like, yeah, I think that's the verb for uh, knowledge there. And, uh, you know, I act like I'm struggling through it, but I, I'm just doing it from English. And uh, I, every time we did that, I'd realize, man, I'm really an imposter <laughs> in this class. And, and it, it really came uh, to, to finality when uh, one of the graduate assistants would always bring the journal articles for the day we'd have to read. He always assigned a lot of reading. And so about halfway through the semester, he came in with the journal articles and he said, Prof, uh, w one of the journal articles you assigned is only available in German. And so I'm thinking immediately, well, good, that's one less journal article I got to read. I'm marking it out of my syllabus. And to my dismay, the, the professor looked at us and he said, well, just do your best. And I'm like, do my best? An article on Greek that's written in German, my best is zero. I mean, uh, unless that article says sauerkraut or docashane, I got nothing, you know? It, it's zero. And, and as I sat there in that circle of PhD candidates who were teaching assistants talking about a German article on Greek, I, I thought, man, these are not my people, you know? <laughs> and, and this is not my language, and, and I don't fit here. And from about that point on, I enjoyed the class. I got stuff out of the class. But from that point on, I really kind of just drifted into the background. And my goal was get through the class without getting called on. Get through the class without getting embarrassed. And, uh, you know, I felt like I was one, I remember being a kid, those Mad Lib books, and it was, I, my, one of my favorites was Circle, the, the picture that doesn't belong, and it'd be like five boys, and one of them's got a tree limb growing out his ear or something, and, <laughs> okay, I'm circling him. I, I was the kid with the tree limb coming out of my ear. Like, if you walked in the class, you'd circle me. This, this is the guy that doesn't belong. And, and you may never have been in a class like that, but you, you know that feeling where the circumstances, the, the people you're around, and, and, and you say, you know what, I, I don't fit. These aren't my people. 
This isn't necessarily my language. This isn't my cup of tea. I, I don't really fit here. I, I remember talking to my great uncle. He was in uh, fought World War II in the South Pacific. And I asked him, I said, how do, you, how do you get through a tour fighting the Japanese? And his answer surprised me. He said, you never volunteer. And I thought, that's a weird answer. And I asked him, why don't you volunteer? And he says, you never volunteer. You never step up. You never stand out. You just keep your head down. You do what you're told and you blend in. He said, that's the way you get through told that story in the morning and Bill Chambly came up and he said, I got a story about volunteering in the military. He said, I was waiting to be deployed and it was in Illinois and it was an icy day and uh, I didn't have anything to do and the commanding officer came in and said, who's got your driver's license? I need somebody with a driver's license. And he said, I was dumb. I stepped up and said, I got my driver's license. He said, good. If you got a driver's license, you can chisel ice. And for the rest of the day, he shoveled ice off the sidewalk. And he said, I learned I never volunteered again. When the commander came in, I hid. And that's the way a lot of us get through life, is that we just want to kind of blend in. We don't want to stand out. We, we just want to kind of get through without being embarrassed, without being disclosed, without being seen for who we are. And uh, we want to look today at, at some young men in the Bible who are in a similar situation. They're in a place where they're not with their people and they're not in their language and, and they don't fit or belong. And yet they're going to do something different. Instead of being embarrassed and silent, they're going to step out in faith. And God is going to initially protect them. And, and then over a course of three years, he's going to promote them. And he, he's going to bless them. You know, Tom's been doing a series on prophecy. He's been going through Daniel. And now we've just started Revelation. We're in Revelation 1. So I thought for one day, if I've got you for one day, why don't we step back and let's look at Daniel. Not the prophecies of Daniel, but let's look at the person of Daniel. Let's ask the question, what kind of guy does God choose to entrust his message to? What kind of man, what kind of young man was Daniel that God would say, he's the one I want to give the prophecies to that are going to bless his generation and now us 2,500 years later that we're still studying? The book of Daniel breaks into two parts. The part we've studied with Tom is the second half, chapter 7 through chapter 12. And that's the prophecies, the prophetic section of Daniel. But the first six chapters of Daniel is narrative, it's story about the person of Daniel. Chapters one through four, we see Daniel as a teenager. And we're, we're going to look at one of those stories today. In chapter five, we see Daniel as a middle aged, probably a man in his 40s. And in Daniel six, we, we see Daniel uh, as, as probably a 70 or 80 year old man. And you see him from the time he's a teen all the way through the time he's 70 or 80, that Daniel, in a tough day, in a wicked place, Daniel stands faithful. So we want to ask the question, why is that? And, and, and what does God have to show us there? And so we're going to look at Daniel 1. Uh, Drew read it this morning. If you turn there with me. Uh, and we're going to see in Daniel 1, just as we move through the chapter, it's going to have really three parts. The first three and a half verses are kind of the setting of the whole book. But we see it, it's really how does Daniel get to Babylon? And I think it has something instructive to say to us. And then, then we'll see the next three or four verses really talk about what was the environment Daniel faced when he got there. And then beginning in verse 8, we're going to see how is it that Daniel responds to the place he's been placed by God and how does he not let it influence him, but does, how does he in turn change everything about uh, Babylon. Babylon doesn't influence Daniel. Dan, Daniel influences Babylon. So we, we want to look at that uh, today. So look at me with verse 1, and we'll begin. It says, in the third year of the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And so in Daniel's day, Israel was divided into two parts. There's northern kingdom, southern kingdom. After Solomon's reign, the, the nation is split. And by the time Daniel is born, the northern kingdom's already gone. They never had a good king, and they're carried into captivity. They are gone. All that's left is this southern kingdom that's called Judah. It's a small place, Jerusalem and the surrounding area, and, and that's all that's left. And before Daniel is born, there's a king, Josiah, who actually is Jehoiakim's dad, and Josiah goes to war against Egypt. And Josiah loses, and the Pharaoh of Egypt kills Josiah. And so Jehoiakim comes to power, and he is under Egyptian control. And Egypt at this time, when Daniel's probably a young boy, goes to war with Babylon. And so Babylon and Egypt are the two big dogs in the world at that time, and now they are fighting each other. And in one of the most significant battles of history, Babylon defeats Egypt. So Daniel 
grows up in a world where his king's been defeated by Egypt, and now his people fight for Egypt, and Egypt's been defeated by Babylon. And we get to verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon, who's defeated Egypt, now starts to settle scores with all of Egypt's friends who opposed him. And we come to verse 1. It says, In the third year of Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes to Jerusalem to besiege it. He's going to take care of all the people that fought with Egypt. And so he settles his armies around Jerusalem. When you think of Jerusalem, don't think of like Dallas or Denton. Think your neighborhood. Jerusalem's probably about one, maybe one and a half square miles inside the wall. And so when you're putting hundreds of thousands of soldiers around, you're not putting them around Denton. Just, just think about your little neighborhood, a couple streets. That, that, that's kind of the area. And that's where Daniel is right now as a teenager. And he's surrounded. Nebuchadnezzar, his name literally means Nabu. Nabu is one of the gods of Babylon. Nabu is the protector of my inheritance. And so you get this pagan king, this pagan Babylonian king coming to besiege, and, and, and he's supported by a pagan Babylonian god, and he comes to besiege Jerusalem. And look what he does. It says that he besieged it into verse 1, verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim into his hand along with the vessels of the house. And Nebuchadnezzar brought the vessels from the temple to the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of, of his God. In, in this day, oftentimes what would happen is when kings would fight kings, it was thought that gods were fighting gods. And when one king defeated another king, he would often pillage the temple or the place where the god's items were, and he would take those out. And he would do it for two reasons. One, he would take them out to show your god can't protect his own house, and your god can't protect his own stuff. What's he going to do for you? Your god can't protect you. And he would also put them in his temple because it was tribute knowing that he felt his god gave him victory. So we see Nebuchadnezzar do that in verse 2. He takes all the stuff out of the temple in Jerusalem and he puts it in, in his God's temple in, in Babylon. But verse 3, he doesn't just want the stuff. Look what he says. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, bring in some of the sons of Israel. He doesn't just want the, the temple possessions. He, he wants the next generation. Bring some of the sons of Israel. The word there for sons is, is literally youth. It would be young sons. And so most commentators think these are young teenagers. Nebuchadnezzar says, bring me the 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old kids. And, and I want you to bring them to Babylon. And it's not just any kids. Look, look what it says. Included in them were some of the royal family and the nobles. I, I want the privileged kids. I want the kids that have had the best education. I, I, I want the kids that, that have been prepared to lead. Those are the kids I want because one... They would be the ones that would lead rebellion against me if they stay. And two, I'm going to put them into my service. They're going to serve me. And so I want the privileged kids. But not just the privileged kids. Look at verse 4. These young people are ones in whom there's no defect, who are good looking, who show intelligence in every branch of wisdom, and who are endowed with understanding and discerning of all knowledge. These will be able to serve me. And so he says, I want the privileged, gifted young people to, to come serve me. He would have taken some of the kids out, out, of, out of this choir. Those are the guys that, that would have been taken to Babylon. And we see in verse 6, Daniel is among those young men who are taken. So think about where Daniel is for a moment. He's probably grown up in a gifted, uh, he's been somewhat gifted, somewhat talented, according to verse 4. Uh, he probably has a little bit of a privileged birth. Uh, he, he's one of the kids that would have had the money to go to the right high school. And he's one of the kids that would have excelled at the right high school. Everybody would have liked him. He would have been successful, probably voted most likely to succeed. That's Daniel. Daniel's got his whole life in front of him, probably envisioning some type of good career in government, uh, going to raise a family, going to be around his parents. It's going to be a good thing. And, and, and it's all turned uh, upside down. His world is, is turned upside down by men and events that are outside his control. Daniel has nothing to do with the disobedience of kings years in the past. Daniel has nothing to do with battles between Babylon and Egypt. Dan Daniel didn't do any of that. He's just a victim who's caught up in, in these bigger issues. And now he's being walked probably at spear point from Jerusalem 
to, to Babylon. Never see his city again. Never see his home again. Never see his parents again. Life for Daniel is, is completely changed. He's just seen his temple pillaged. He's just seen his God defeated. And he's just seen his world turned upside down. You ever been there? You ever been at that point where Daniel probably was as he was walking in that heat, physically exhausted, emotionally spent, not sure what the future holds? Daniel probably didn't know his slavery, loneliness, abuse, death, and, and yet he has to walk. Uh, for, for us, it's not kings coming into Denton. It, it might be a diagnosis at a doctor's office, financial hardship, something going on with maybe one of your kids, something at a job. Suddenly you think, God, where are you? God, do you see me? And God, do you care? Because God, if you see, Daniel had to think, God, if you see that I'm walking to Babylon with the Spirit in my back, either you're not there or you don't care. And, and, and Daniel just has to keep walking. I imagine he had to ask the questions, where are you, God? What are you doing, God? And, and, and yet he just, he just walks on. I think there was no way for Daniel to know as he was walking to Babylon what God was planning for him. There, there was no way he could understand what God was doing in his life. And I think it's interesting, God in the text never asks him to understand. He never expects him to understand but, but I think God did expect him, you, you just keep walking. You just keep walking right where you, I know where you are, and you trust me, and, and, and you walk on. God was doing something in him much bigger than he could have ever understood. And I think on that walk, Daniel began to get an understanding of God, that God, you have control of my world. God, you have control of my life. And all you ask of me is to walk in trust, and obedience to you. And so he walks. But life doesn't get easier quick. Look what happens at the end of verse 4. So he walks, he gets to Babylon, and says, and the king ordered that uh, the young men be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed daily food rations in verse 5. And in verse 6, we're told of four of the boys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. In verse 7, they're given new names. So Daniel doesn't know what his future holds, but Nebuchadnezzar sure does, doesn't he? Nebuchadnezzar has a plan, and he says, I'm going I'm to take these Jewish young men and young women, and I'm going to do five things to them. I'm going to give them literature. I, and literally, it says that he told uh, his, his commander to teach them the book, the book of the Chaldeans. You take away that book of Israel, you take away the Bible, and you give them our book. You give them our literature. Don't let them read about God. Let them read about Babylon. And so I want to take over their minds. But I don't just want their minds. I want you to give them our language. Take away the language of Hebrew and give them the language of, of uh, Babylon. Give, give them Aramaic. I, I want them to speak our language because language in many ways helps us define our world. It gives us our worldview. And language also allows us to talk and to develop relationships with other people. And Nebuchadnezzar doesn't want these Jewish boys just hanging out talking Hebrew to themselves. He wants them to know uh, his language so that they can build deep relationships and become more and more Babylonian uh, each day. And so I want their mind. I want their mouth. I'm going to give them food because I want them to eat food that I provide. I want them to eat food that's dedicated to my gods. I want, to eat, I want them to eat food that goes against their Bible because I want them to act like Babylonians. See what he's doing? I want their mind. I want their mouth. I want their hands. And then verse 7, I want their very identity. See, the names of these four boys, Daniel, Hananiah, uh, me, uh, Mishael and Azariah, all those names uh, say something about those boys' relationships to God. And Nebuchadnezzar takes away their Jewish names that talk about God and gives them Babylonian names that speak about Babylonian God. So Daniel, whose name uh, means God is my judge, God is the one who will judge me, he's given the name Belteshazzar, which means Bel is my prince. And so I will, I will no longer answer to God. I will answer to the Babylonian God. That, that's the idea in the name. 
Hananiah, his name means beloved of God. And his name is changed to Shadrach, which means receives light from the sun God. So Hananiah, God loves you. Now, Shadrach, you, you get wisdom, you get light, you get your life from the sun god. Forget Yahweh. It's the sun god for you. For, for Mishael, it's who is like the Lord. It's a beautiful name. That, that there is no god like the god of Israel. Mishael, we're going to change your name to Meshach. Not who is like the Lord, but who is like Venus. Venus is the one you should pay allegiance to. And then Azariah, the Lord is my help. His name was changed to Abednego. Servant of Nego. And so even in the names, Nebuchadnezzar tries to remove every vestige of God. Everything that, that could help these young men stay true to their commitment to God, he tries to pull it away. Kerry Moore came up to me in between services, and he said he heard a, a pastor say one time, I think it's a great question, that he was talking through the names of these four boys and the question the pastor asked was, what name does the world give you? What name does the world give you? And I think that, that's a good question. That, that we are often always trying to establish our identity for other people. I want the world to think of me, Mike, the successful one. You know, you might call me Mike, the clumsy one, you know. But, but what names does, am I fighting to establish? What names does the world give me? And, and do I find my identity in you, or, or, or do I find it in God? And I, I think Nebuchadnezzar is pretty genius. He thinks if I can change the way they think, if I can change the way they talk, if I can change what they do, and if I can change their identity, then I got them. Think about how successful it was. Commentators say that upwards of 10,000 Jewish youth were taken away. How many in verse 6 do we have that stay faithful? Four. I'm not a math major. I see Valerie Parson out there. You probably do the math on it. But that's a pretty high percentage. I'd say it's over 99%. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar got over 99% of, of the youth of his day to turn to his culture. You know, there's studies done in our day that 75% of church-going high school kids, by the time they're juniors in college, have walked away from the faith. Many of them turn back as they get older. But 75% turn away. And so does this pressure happen to us? I, I think most certainly it does. That our world says if they can impact the way we think, the way we talk, the way we act, and our identity, then, then they got us. Then they got us. And so Nebuchadnezzar was trying to brainwash these guys. The definition of brainwashing is to indoctrinate a person so that they abandon their beliefs in favor of another set of beliefs. And the brainwashing is often done through prolonged stress that breaks down an individual's physical and mental defenses. And God was doing something through these boys, but Nebuchadnezzar sought to counteract it by putting prolonged stress on them. Every day I'm going to hit them with, with Babylonian literature and Babylonian language and Babylonian food and Babylonian names. And they're going to go to bed and they're going to wake up the next day and I'm going to hit them with Babylonian literature and Babylonian language and Babylonian food and Babylonian names. And I'm going to do it for three years. And that prolonged stress is going to tear them down so that they are swept off their feet and, and I can sweep them away and they'll be mine and, and they won't be God's. And it happens in Babylonian days and I think it happens in ours. Uh, I think a good image for that is the waves of the ocean. If you've ever been to the ocean, I know most of y'all have been to the ocean, but if you've played in the waves, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, my family, we were at the ocean last summer and about halfway through our trip, uh, we were a little bit bummed. We heard a tropical storm was coming in. It was coming in right over us. And it was going to be rainy and all that. So at first we thought, well, what are we going to do now? It's going to be rainy. But we thought, I mean, we're in the ocean. We're getting wet anyway. There's no lightning with the tropical storm. So let's, let's go to the ocean. And so we went to the ocean. We had the ocean all to ourselves. And uh, the day before the waves, you know, they were about uh, chest high maybe on me. And, and that day the storm was coming in. They, they were probably five feet over my head. I mean, they, they, huge waves. And uh, me and my three boys, we came up with a game. We said, let's see who can stand the longest and let those waves hit you and, and just see who can. We, we played this game over and over, who could stand the longest. And we found out something. It's never the first wave that gets you. You're standing there because you're kind of locked in, you're braced for it, and that, man, that big wave hits you, and it and it, it, it'll rattle you a little bit, and you'll fall back a little bit. But it, it never knocked any of us down. 
But as soon as that wave was done and, and now the undertow is pulling at your feet and the sand's coming out from under your feet, you don't have time to reset your feet because you know what's happening. That next wave is hitting you. And that second wave, usually we stuttered a little bit more. But man, by the third and fourth wave, I don't think any of us ever made it five waves. I bet we stayed out there for two hours and nobody could stay five waves. Because the relentless pounding of wave after wave after wave after wave, it took our, our footing away and the undertow was pulling us and the wave would crash on us. And, and, and eventually we just, we gave way under the pressure. And, and when you get hit by a wave like that and you're underwater and then the next wave hits, it turns you over and, and, and your world is topsy-turvy. You don't even know which way's up anymore. And we would have to help each other stand up in the water. And, and I think that's what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do to these boys. And that's what our world often does to us is that it is a relentless pounding of literature and language and, and, and actions and identity. And it wears us down. And it wears us down. And it wears us down. And, and, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar was, was doing here. I had the opportunity, I, I do chapels for a school here in town. And uh, this, this semester, this spring, we looked at Daniel. Because I think if there's anything our teenagers need to hear, it, it is Daniel 1 to 6. That they need to know how to stand against that relentless beating of our culture. But I think it's important for us as adults too, isn't it? Uh, I, I, I think our world is the same as the world of Daniel. And as you sit here today, you may, you may identify where Daniel was when he was walking. There, there may be things going on in your life. Where you, you got that diagnosis recently or financially or at your work or in your marriage or with a kid. And you say, God, where are you? Do you know where I am? And, and, and you're tempted to question because it looks like God's either defeated or he doesn't care. But then there's others of us in here that, that feel this pressure of Daniel in Babylon, where day after day, the people and circumstances around you are pounding at you and pounding at you and, and, and wearing you down. And I think the great temptation for Daniel as he sat in those classes was to say, these are not my people. This is not my language. I, I don't fit here. And I just want to blend into the background. And, and I think the great temptation for each of us is to say that same thing. If you're in a workplace where guys are doing things dishonestly, you say, man, these aren't my people. This isn't my language. I, 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 don't, I don't feel good doing that. And, but I'm not sure what to do. And, it, and it's pounding me. It's relentless. And so I, I just kind of want to withdraw from the fight for a while. And the fascinating thing to me is what Daniel does in the face of this prolonged three-year daily stress. Look, look at verse 8, and we'll, we'll see what he does here. It says in verse 8, But Daniel made up his mind. I think it's interesting. This is the first thing we see Daniel do in the whole book. Daniel's going to serve in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel's going to be the second most powerful person in the country. He's going to serve multiple kings. There's going to be a war in the middle of the book where the Babylonians are destroyed and the Persians come to power. And Daniel goes from being the second most powerful person in Babylon to being the second most powerful person in Persia. That, that, that he serves faithfully year after year after year. But before the visions, before the lion's den, before the conversations with kings... Verse 8 is the first thing we ever see Daniel do, and it's something he does in the private, uh, internal uh, reality of, of his mind. It says that he made up his mind. The word literally means he set his heart. He decided something firmly. That he, he dug in on this and said, this is what I'm going to do. I may be the only one that does it, but this is, is what I'm going to do. In the privacy of his own mind, he drew a red line and said, I won't cross it. You know, a red line is a line that you, if you cross it, you can't cross it and continue to be in safety. And, and Daniel says, you know what? I'll take Babylon's language. I'll take their literature. I'll even take their name. Who cares what somebody calls me? But I will not do something that goes against my Bible and I will not deny my God to build my kingdom so that I have a good reputation. And I will not deny my God to build someone else's kingdom. 
because I'm committed to the kingdom of God. Daniel is going to resist. He's going to rebel in a sense. But his rebellion is not out of independence or or a lack of submission. His rebellion is the result of complete and and utter um, loyalty to God. That, That he will not do something that goes against God. And he resolves uh, in his mind. I think it's Daniel's conviction about God that leads to his resolve. And it's his resolve that will lead to 70 years of faithful action. And and, and we see that. We see in the next few verses, we we see his his initial actions. Look um, there in verse 8, it says, He wouldn't defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he was permitted to drink. And so he makes a request of the commander in verse 10 um, that he would be able to just eat vegetables. Uh, For a teenager to say, hey, take away the pizza and the wine and the steak and give me vegetables. I mean, that's pretty supernatural anyway right there. But, uh, you know, he he doesn't just go along and say, I'll eat whatever. He doesn't uh, start a rebellion. He doesn't get all the Jewish guys and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. When they bring the food in, we're going to turn over the tables and we're going to... He politely... And he creatively says, uh, I I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. This is a red line I won't cross. Because in the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament, uh, there were commands about how food was to be prepared. There were commands about what could be eaten. And this food was not prepared according to the Old Testament law. This food was probably dedicated to idols. And uh, Daniel said, I can't do that. I, I, I won't do that. And uh, we see his, the initial response in verse 10. We see the commander says, I, I, I can't do this, Daniel. I can't do what you ask because it could cost me my life. And what he doesn't say there, but I think it's important to point out, if Nebuchadnezzar would kill the faithful commander, what do you think Nebuchadnezzar would do to a Jewish teenager? I mean, Daniel's putting his life on the line here over, over uh, some food and some wine. But he's putting his life on the line to say that I will submit my life in all areas to God. And, and whatever comes, it comes, but this is where I stand. The, these are my red lines. I, I think, uh, you know, he valued the opinion of God more than the opinions of the Babylonians. I think he, he valued the word of Moses more than the word of peers. We're not told what his peers said, but I can imagine. Uh, he's not doing this in a vacuum. Other people, uh, other kids know that he's trying to take a stand uh, for God. You know, I, I'd speak at a, a school here in town. I was telling you, it, it's a hard place to be a faithful Christian because uh, sometimes the other kids will put pressure on the kids, say, look, come on. You really going to, you, you're going to take that stand? You, you're going to stand for G, you know, Jesus freak, all that kind of stuff. Um, you don't think these guys did that? You, you're, you're still talking that God stuff, Daniel? Don't you know all this... All the stuff that was in the temple is now in this Babylonian temple. God lost. Give it up, Daniel. Or, or saying, Daniel, don't you dare risk, if Nebuchadnezzar gets mad at you, he might kill all of us. You better eat that food. We're, we're not told what his peers said, but he doesn't care about the word of his peers. And he resolves to stand for right, even if he's by himself. I think it's interesting. God gave him three buddies to stand with him. And... Uh, uh, you know, I even think about those waves that oftentimes those waves were hitting us in the ocean that day. We had to help each other stand up, you know. And uh, if you're a senior getting ready to go off to college, man, you find, uh, you, you find you some buddies that, that will stand with you, that, that, that will in, encourage you. But, you know, we, we don't have those same dietary restrictions. Uh, the Bible and the New Testament get, says that we're free to eat of anything. But do do we have some red lines we can't cross? Are are there things that our culture says is okay that you and I know are not okay for us? Uh, We all should say yes to that. I I hope we have red lines. Standards that that we refuse to compromise. No matter what happens, we're going to trust God. Just just, uh, here at the end of the, the verse, we see what happens. The overseer in verse 10 says, no, I can't do it. So Daniel says in verse 12, how, how about we just do a test? In verse 14, the, the commander says, okay, I'll test you for 10 days. And I'm going to give you vegetables for 10 days. So they eat vegetables for 10 days. And you see in verse 15 what happens is at the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better. And they were more healthy than all the other youths. The word there for healthier is actually they were fatter of flesh. 
I think it's interesting. One of the big diets today is the Daniel diet. You know, if you go and Google it, I Googled it there today. Man, there's hundreds of links and there's a bunch of books about how to diet like Daniel did. Daniel got fatter. The, the text says that Daniel did the diet and he got fatter. That, that's the point of the text. So if that's what you're going for, do the Daniel diet. But otherwise, you're, you're, you're probably exegeting that wrong. But uh, that has nothing to do with the sermon. I, I just think it's interesting. But so after the 10 days, the commander says, okay, we'll keep doing it. And for the next three years, Daniel commits himself to study. He learns the language. He accepts his name, but, but he eats the vegetables. And, and, and we see in verse 17, uh, it says, as for the four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch. Daniel understood dreams. So at the end of the time, Nebuchadnezzar comes in. And the king found uh, in verse 19, the king talked with all the young people and out of them, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael. And look down at verse 20. It says, these four young men were found ten times better than any of the conjurers or magicians or anyone who was serving Nebuchadnezzar. That they were ten times better than anybody else. But what's interesting to me, they don't get to be ten times better until they've walked in faithfulness for three years. Daniel has to walk at the end of the spear and just trust God. Daniel has to take a stand and resolve in his mind, I'm going to stand for God no matter what happens. And I'm going to do it day after day after day for three years. And at the end of the three years, Daniel gets to see, man, God showed up. God, God paid off. You know, I, I think uh, one of the interesting things about this passage that I kind of skipped over is this passage really talks about what a great guy Daniel was. This passage elevates Daniel as, as a young man who was committed, who, who had made his mind up to stand for God in, in the hardest of circumstances, that Daniel knew God was in control of his world. Even when his world was out of control, Daniel knew he was in control of his world. Daniel knew that he was in control of his life. And uh, e even when his life was uncertain, he knew God was in control of his life. And he knew that all he was asked to do was to trust and to walk in obedience by God's grace, and he did it. But what we can read over sometimes is what was God doing while Daniel was walking in faithfulness? You know, you know God's activity in this chapter is subtle, uh, but it's there. In fact, three times God is said to do something in this, in this chapter. It's in verse 2, verse 9, and verse 17. Look at it real quick and we'll close with this. All three times it's the same verb. You see it there at the beginning of verse 2. God gave. Verse 9 it says, God gave, and in verse 17, God gave. That while Daniel is walking in faithfulness, God is working behind the scenes, giving and giving and giving. In verse 2, look what he gives. He gives hardship. The, the, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, the, the carrying off of the, the temple goods, the, the defeat of Jehoiakim, it wasn't because God was absent or it wasn't because God was unable. That's what Nebuchadnezzar thought. I beat your God because your God's weaker. Now it says in verse 2, Nebuchadnezzar beat God because God gave Israel to him as punishment. And I think it's interesting that Daniel's hardships were filtered through God's hands. That, that God wasn't absent and God wasn't uncaring. God knew exactly where Daniel was and God walked with him as he gave him over to those hardships. God may not have made himself known, but he, he was there. And if you're walking through hardships today, know that God is with you. You may not like where you are. There, I've been at times and places I, I didn't uh, like where God had me. But we always have to know that God knows where we are. He's with us and, and he cares about us. And, and he's doing something in the midst of the hardest of circumstances. He is. The second thing you'll notice is in verse 9, it says, God gave Daniel favor and compassion with the overseer. Just Daniel saying, hey, whoa, uh, question, could have gotten him killed. When Daniel said, how about just give me vegetables, I could have gotten him killed. But it says it didn't get him killed because God gave Daniel something. Daniel had to step up and act in faith. But when he did, God made sure he was taken care of. And God gave him favor in his re relationships. God's working behind the scenes. And then in verse 17, it says, as these four youths, God gave them. 
It's not that these were just the smartest guys. It's not, Daniel may have studied hardest, we don't know. But it's not just he was smartest or he studied hardest. It says that God gave him knowledge and intelligence. God made him 10 times better. Daniel's world was controlled by God and God gave the events in Daniel's world. Uh, Daniel's relationships were controlled by God and God gave him favor in his interpersonal relationships. And Daniel himself, his, his, his internal knowledge and abilities were controlled by God and it's God who acted, God who gave to Daniel. And so I, I think the text would say to us today, what, what kind of guy does God give his message to? What kind of person, what kind of man, what kind of woman does God give his message to? To say, I want this person to speak for me. I think it's a, a, a person like Daniel. It's a person who believes deeply in the sovereignty of God. That regardless of my circumstances, regardless of my situation, I trust God. God's in control of my world. God's in control of my life. And I'm just going to do the best I can by God's grace to walk in faith and trust and obedience with him today. And then I'm, I'm just going to let him take care of the rest. That's the kind of person God chooses to use. And I think that's the kind of person God calls us to be. So as I stand here today, I, I don't know what's going on in many of your lives. You, you may be like Daniel walking to Babylon and you don't know what your next day holds. You, you don't know if your health will hold out. You don't know about your kid. You don't know about your job. You, you don't know. But God knows and God's with you and God may be doing something in your life that's far greater than you, you could ever imagine. Or you may be like Daniel who is in Babylon and you're feeling just that relentless pounding of wave after wave of our world coming down on you and the challenge to make your kingdom or the kingdom of someone else bigger than God's kingdom. My encouragement to you would be to look to Daniel and to say whatever your circumstance is, know that God has you there. And that God is, is a God who's sovereign and God is in control of everything in our world and God is in control of my life and your life. And that all you're called to do is not understand, but you're called to trust and to walk in obedience. Will you pray with me? Father, we do, um, I, I just as we listen to teenagers sing to us and minister to us as we see their gifts, as, as we see their hearts, uh, then as we study about a teenager uh, from long ago, we see ourselves, we, we see uh, the way you work in our lives. God, I, I just thank you for the examples you give us of, of, of a generation who can rise up. And though uh, the day looks dark and though the path is uncertain and though the pressure from our world is relentless, that whether we're a teenager, an adult, a businessman, a, a businesswoman, a homemaker, a parent, a grandparent, a student, that God, you, you are in control. And I pray that we would be a church, we'd be families, we'd be individuals who would trust your sovereignty. We would believe your sovereignty. We would believe in your goodness. And we would know that wherever we are today, we are here because God, you've given us the opportunity to be here, and that, God, you are doing something in our lives. And, God, I pray that we would walk in trust and faith in you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.